strong and so um, um, just uh, beautiful items beautiful beautifully made perfect straight and uh, um, just uh, the original person I knew that made them was totem hair he was known for medicine and he was known for gigs and uh, and uh, I'm when I found out that that had been passed down to after totem passed I was very very happy to hear that so so hopefully someone will be here, someone here might be inspired to continue some of these crafts we're presenting. They are very important, they are a part of us. They were important to us, uh, our survival even. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that the younger generation, or you, anyone, anyone can do this, anyone. No one is too old or too young uh, to, to carry on the culture. And so that's why we present these things because th these things are, uh, valuable parts of our community too. So we're gonna try to do this without Kevin Stretch tonight. That's the first time. So <laughs> he works hard for us, so he's taking a little vacation time. Thank you. 
Lindsay, I want you to make me a gift. Okay, ready to go? Okay. God, it's great to have you here. Thank you for coming. It's really good to see everybody again. We have a full house. Uh, we're very excited. We've had some really great presentations. Tonight is going to be another great presentation. Yes, Judy. Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't go out to the people, but it's being recorded anyway. Thank you, though. He's always. My son's always got my back. Always, always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but uh, again, thank you all for coming. And um, I love that people are getting excited about our culture. It is uh, who we are. All these things we do, say, believe, think, that's, that's us. That's, that's who we are, and these things are important. And so tonight, uh, really excited to have Larry Shade here. Larry is from the Lost City community. He's married to Shelly and has four grown children I said, Larry, how, tell me how old your kids are. And he was saying 30, 29. I said, I, I was thinking under 10. <laughs> and so uh, our Cherokee men age very well. Uh, us women, I, I hope, I hope, we'll, we'll see. But uh, he's got four children. He's the son of Hastings and Loretta Shade. Now Hastings, many of you know him, knew him. Uh, as our uh, former deputy chief of the Cherokee Nation, as a friend, a uh, community member, uh, he was uh, an amazing person. And he passed on this, uh, this knowledge of gig making to Larry, and I imagine a lot, a lot of things uh, about uh, who we are as a people. Uh, Loretta, who's a very quiet woman, if anybody's ever around Loretta, has done some pretty amazing things in her own right too, earning a master's degrees in counseling and education. And she's now working and doing some translation work for us at the Cherokee Nation. Uh, so he's had some really strong influences in his life and, and you can see that. You can see by the way he carries himself. He, he's been taught well <coughs> and taught by the best. Uh, Larry works for Sequoia High Schools and the Cherokee Immersion Charter School. He has taught science and math and is a coach and uh, again just very happy to have uh, Larry Shade here to teach us about gig making. This is again a very 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 rare item. Uh, he may be one of two uh, of all the Cherokees, over 300,000 Cherokees. This is it. This is it that's actively doing this here. So keep that in mind and, uh, and uh, please welcome Larry Shade. Widow. OCO, Nagata. Uh, my name is Larry Shades, and again, uh, I am Cherokee of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, I'm 52 years old, and the craft that I love doing is a craft that my dad so dearly loved. Um, you know, a lot of people have asked me, uh, Larry, how come you don't, do you have a business card? And I, you know, I say no, because I look at it this way. If I carry business cards, then, you know, I have a business. But to me, what I do is not about a business, it's about a love for it, and a lot of you know, I have a lot of customers that come in and, and order gigs, just specific gigs that are of a specific type or a specific wood. And just by word of mouth, that's, you know, how things get out there. You know, I, I don't have a store or anything. I don't have a website or anything. It's just a, a lot of what my dad did is what I carry on. And, uh, you know, I miss him dearly. But, uh, you know, the craft that he loved is, is what I carried on. And, and when he, you know, when he had... Uh, that night that we were visiting with him before he passed away, he called the three boys in and he told us, you know, some things that he wanted, he wanted us to do. And, you know, one was take care of mom, you know, which we dearly do. You know, she lives right next door to us and, you know, we're around her 24 seven. So, you know, it's just, you know, that's how we were raised. I didn't have deadbeat parents. I had parents who were with us all the time. And even when dad was uh, deputy chief of the Cherokee Nation, he was out in the communities and he was always out. But when my kids had activities, he was always there with us and always there to support us, you know, and I, you know, I did a little clip there for uh, the OCO of Voices of the Cherokee People, and a lot of it was about him because, you know, a lot of what we do is carry on for, you know, carry on the tradition and the history and the culture of what he loved so dearly. And I, in my, my lifetime, I have seen 
and he has introduced us to a lot. I've seen a lot. I understand what it means to be Cherokee, to live the culture, to remember the history. And if you ever get a chance, go to North Carolina because, you know, ideally, you know, in reality, that's our homeland. And when you go there, and if you've never been, I, you know, I ask that you go there just once in your lifetime, you will understand that, you know, what home means. And the people there, when you meet the people, it is just like going to the neighbor's house and being invited for dinner. That, to me, you know, if my family, my, my, my wife and my little one, if we could ever move somewhere, that's where they wanted to move to was North Carolina. So, but <clears throat> anyway, I am a fourth generation blacksmith. My great grandfathers, Albert Shade and Charlie Smith, they, they taught my dad, and dad tells a story. He said he was four years old when uh, they taught him, and Tom Shade also taught him. Well, there's, uh, they, sh they taught him different techniques of gig making, but there's a gentleman that also influenced dad in a special technique, and that was totem hair. And being little, I, I remember going to Jay and going to his house, and there was a stump there, his forge and everything was over here, and I remember sitting in that stump, you know, two or three hours at a time, and I'd get ready to move, and Dad would get on to me. He said, no, you sit right there and you watch one of these days. And, you know, he would, he would say it outright. One of these days, one of us, or maybe both of us are not going to be here, and somebody's going to have to carry this on. And little, you know, did I know that time is now. And there is, a, you know, she mentioned there's another gentleman. He doesn't do a traditional gig. He is from Missouri. And you know, and I met him just by just by you know by listening. One time we were traveling, and we went to a, a, a little gigging contest. And this gentleman was walking around, and he was every artisan there that was you know crafting gigs. A lot of them were cutting them out with a torch and welding the ferrule on. But he made sure that he made contact with all of the you know of the blacksmiths. What would, what would we call a fair? And his name is Ray Joe Hastings. And I thought that was you know, that was pretty neat. And he's an older gentleman now, and I haven't talked to him in several years, but uh, I sent him a couple of gigs because he collects gigs that are made by different artisans. But I just thought that was pretty neat that his last name is Hastings and my dad's first name was Hastings. So, but anyway, what is a gig? <coughs> a gig is a spear or metal object that has a specific number of prongs. Some are small to gig small fish, crayfish. Some of them are large and they have barbs on them. And when you gig a fish with it, the barbs used to hold the fish on so it doesn't get away. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of them during gigging contests make sure that when they gig a fish that they want, it needs to be counted. And I've made gigs anywhere from uh, that are small up to a foot and a half, two foot long. I've made poles out of, you know, that are up to 15, 16 feet long. That's the longest one I've made. That is a long pole. So, but anyway, <coughs> gigging is a, Gigging is basically spearing a animal or fish by an object and acquiring that that animal for you know to eat or for sustenance. That's one of the ideas behind it, behind it. The Cherokees use it traditionally before contact. What we say before contact is before we met Europeans that came in. We would uh, whittle sticks and long uh, limbs of wood and we would use them for spears and that's how we would uh, gig fish and we went, then after contact we got to watch the Europeans and how they fabricated or forged tools and one of the ways that we saw was that we could we could make our own gigs and attach them to wood poles and that was the traditional way for what we did as far as being able to uh, being able to gig fish and uh, acquire substance. A lot of them now you see them you know I take my kids out, or my, my sons out, you know, during the summer, we gig on the creek. You know, there are a few in the communities like Jay and Uchi and every now and then, but, you know, they have gigging contests now. This is more of a cultural part. I mean, has anybody ever been to the uh, gigging contest there in Lake Uchi? It, it's, it's big. So, and, but I, you know, this is what I do, but I've never been, and I've always planned on going, so maybe one of these days I'll get over there and get to, get to April. visit. Second weekend in April? Okay. So a gig is a spear metal object that has a specific number of prongs with a ferrule. The ferrule is the cone-shaped part of the gig that attaches to the wood. Uh, some of them are small, and I have a crawdad gig here. This is the one that my son made, and like I said, it's, you know, it's a tradition that needs to be passed on. But this is a gig that my son made. It's got long tines on it. Some people like 
um, a long time gig because you know they when they gig crawdads it's time consuming to gig a crawdad and then transfer it to a bucket my dad would call it stacking he would gig one press it into the rocks the crawdad would slide up here and he would slide over and gig another one he'd have four or five on his gig and then he would reach over and slide them in the bucket so one of the you know uh, a lot of people that go with us understand we can gig a lot of crawdads in a short amount of time which you know practice and knowing the location but a lot of the uh, a lot of the places where we we have crawdads or you know there are a lot of people that know where these places are at it's a very secluded places that you know I've got to look for the last couple of years that you know a lot, some landowners have let me on their places to hunt crawdads but there's a one little place or the creek just up from us that I mean you know you guys probably know it is a, it, there's a lot of crawdads there but uh, you'll see in the slideshow here in a little bit my son gig one this this summer we gigged I don't know probably 10 or 10 or 12 but it's a it's a big crawdad and that place is secret so <laughs> oh. but there <clears throat> gigging was common among the Cherokees but only after contact with the Europeans did we learn to make useful tools um, so what we used when uh, after contact we we tried to figure out what we could use to for the fire to heat the metal so we didn't have access to coal so we used walnut hulls hickory nut hulls and that was mostly our heat source and so we had acquired coal like like the Europeans had so once we acquired coal then th this process took off and also in, in, in the slide so I also make hatchets and and I've also made other things for you know farmers that have something that would break down on their tractor so I've been called upon to you know make fabricate some different different things okay all right let me play this little clip
That voice was my dad, and you know I feel very fortunate that I have clippings from different, you know, interviews that he's had. There's uh, there was a couple of OETA specials that he's done. You know, I hold that true to my heart because you know, a lot of us we don't all we have is pictures, but we're fortunate that I can show these to my kids or their grand my their my grandkids when they're you know who you know what he was about. Okay, there's a, there's a story, the legend of the kingfisher. As legend has it, the kingfisher was meant to be a water bird, but as he had not been given either a web feed or a good bill, he could not make a living. The animals held counsel over it to decide to make him a bill like a long, sharp awe, so they made him a fish gig and fastened to the front of his mouth. He flew to the top of the tree, sailed out, and darted down into the water and came up with a fish on his nigga-gisty gig, and then, then he has been the best gigger of all the animals. Degati? Gigging is the practice of hunting fish or small game with a gig or some are multi-pronged spear gigging. Common, again, was um, among the Cherokees. And after contact, uh, we learned to make useful tools. So a lot of that is what I've already mentioned. Okay. Now, what I'm getting ready to show you, uh, and I was, t I was, as I was telling her a while ago, I can't bring my forge out here and you know build a fire in the building. There's a, you know, there's a lot of things that go with it. The coal itself, you know, emits. Uh, fumes and smoke so I wish I, I, wish I could uh, I can fasten you know I can fa make a crawdad gig in about 45 minutes a fish gig you know about an hour so it is a you know it's a timely process but once you acquire a skill and it's something that you love doing because uh, you have to heat the metal and then bring it back to hammer and then you have all these different tools and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's one of the hammers we use, and you have special pliers. And the spikes that we use, the spikes that we use are to shape the ferrule. So I'm telling you we've got a lot of trade secrets right here, okay? So, but that, we have different size spikes to help shape different size ferrules. You can see there's one, this one right here is probably maybe a little over five-eighths of an inch, or close to three-quarters. And again, this one right here is barely three-eighths, or almost a, a quarter inch. So the, you know, the ferrule, there are different spikes that we have. And some of them that we've made, and, um, some of them we have made, and I found a couple of them this summer in the, in a yard sale. Uh, a lot of them have been spikes that are used for construction, for tying down uh, framing or uh, grade stakes. But anyway, and then, uh, so here's the, a few of the spikes. Uh, there's different chisels, and again, you will, you'll, the chisels are used to split the, to, uh, and I'll show you, you'll see in just a minute. We, I take a piece of metal as a beginning, and this, uh, this little piece of metal about this size can become the start of a crawdad gig to this size. And it's just about drawing the metal out and seeing how it works, being able to work with the color of the metal. So that's, a, that's an important part of it. Okay, again, there's all of, there's, that's just, just some of the tools that, uh, that we have. Uh, all right, uh, and this is not a real good picture, but this is, uh, we have, uh, I have three, well, we have three bellows that Dad acquired, and this one right here is, is the one that we've used. Uh, it's been in that same spot ever since I can remember. We moved there in 1965, and it, it went up when I was little, and it's the very same one that we, that's been there. There's been lots of things built around it. There's been two or three sheds that have been built around it, but this, is, this one has uh, stood through time. And again, this is just a small, this is one of the, one of the forges. It's a handmade forge. This is basically the end of a, 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 a large pipe that was a capped in, and we cut the end of it off and fastened the legs to it. 
And you have to have a means for the air to, to travel through. And the air travels through here from, uh, air travels through here. And it has a stopper on it, so it pushes the air up through. Uh, it's a little grate at the bottom. You load your coal and you start your fire. And you can use little sticks and leaves and stuff to start your fire. And it's a mid-grade cold. Uh, mid-grade cold is about the cheapest you can buy. A low-grade has a lot of slag in it. Uh, if you get a low-grade coal and you're using it, you're constantly cleaning slag out. And you can find little pancakes of slags in there that'll keep your air from going. So, and it also reduces your heat and it doesn't allow you to work as fast. And there's another picture of, and this is, uh, I mean, this is part of dad's ingenuity. So he was, all right, this anvil is, a, is an anvil that my dad made and you know, through the wintertime it gets rusty. But, uh, during the summertime it gets used a lot. And you can see how it's kind of, uh, you can see where we hammer. And it, you know, I take a grinder every now and then and flatten it out and take out the little, uh, the dings. It doesn't look like a traditional anvil. The, uh, there's a square piece right here, which is real important because when we get the metal out to what we call a spoon shape, we heat it and we lay it at the edge and we hit the inside of it and that, that is what causes the ferrule to roll over. And then we use the spikes to shape the metal. To, we start at the ferrule first and then we work at the tines. And there's different marks on there for different lengths of gigs. There's also different marks for different widths of ferrule. Uh, all of these have been chipped in or cut in through time. And uh, even the little the, the wood down there is, was, it was there whenever, it's, it's about to rot out of there. So in the near future, I'm gonna have to find another stump. Anyway, this is part of what, what it looks like when it's, when it's working. There's a piece of metal at the top, and usually I put a piece of metal at the top. And uh, once that metal heats over, I, I transfer it to the anvil, and that helps heat the anvil. If you have a cold anvil, uh, you're not able to hammer as much or as long, so you have to get the anvil good and hot. And it's uh, it gets and it gets really hot. It gets so hot that you can't touch it with with a bare hand. You have to uh, have to use gloves. Anyway, there's another. And a lot of people. Um, there's different colors of the metal to work with. It starts out in, in, a, in a low reddish color, which it's about, about 1400 to 1500 degrees. And then it goes to uh, what we call a bright red. And that bright red is at about, it's about 1600. And it gets into, once it gets into the orange stage, well, the orange stage is where what we work with the metal. And it's also where we temper the metal when it gets to that orange stage. Once it gets in that orange stage, then it goes to yellow. That yellow is the very maximum that you want your metal to get. Once it gets from yellow to white, when it gets to white, it starts bubbling. All the impurities that are in it starts bubbling out, and then the metal itself will melt. So you can. I have ruined good pieces almost to finish, and that happened. I've had, in, in some, and in some instances, it tempers itself, and uh, you just, it's just, it's a process that you have to, that, I don't know, working with it so long, you acquire a knowledge to, to see. It's just like a, it's just like your, your, your grandparents or your, your mom when she was cooking. She didn't have a measuring cup. Everything was, you know, understood. She knew how much of this and how much of that and how much of that to do. And that this is basically what you learn over time. Um, I've, had, I've had temperature guns out there testing at different stages. So that's how I, that's how I know the temperature of those different stages. Okay. This piece of metal is right here. I, I was going to work with it, but you can see it's almost six inches long. This will make a, this will make a gig that will, uh, you can draw it out to about 10 inches, 11 inches, depending upon the size of the time. And you'll get to see this little piece of metal right here is what um, I started this, is what this is from. And you can see it's three inches. And, was, and what we do is we take this metal here and we start to draw it out and we flatten it out to a workable shape. We get the top of it square enough that when I flatten it out, the ferrule will be the size of ferrule that I need, then I roll it over. And then the next thing we do is once we get our ferrule set, we work on the neck part of it, which is, which is this part right here. So we take it and then we, we get ready to, I mean, and you can make the ferrule as long as you want with drawing it out, as long as the metal stays a, a certain thickness. 
and if you get it too thin, then once it cools, it'll crack. So you have to be really careful. And you can see there's a, you know, there's a small ferrule. And on the three-prong gig here, you know, this one, this one is a gig that my dad made. I mean, we have everything that he made, he sold. So, but this is one of that, that he made. You know, we have very few, I have a three-prong gig. My son has two gigs. And uh, Dondi, my brother, he has a, uh, he has a crawdad gig that he made. And that's all we have of what he made. Everything he had, he sold. And, you know, his, his demeanor was, you know, if I make it and keep it, what's it going to do? Set on the shelf, never be used, while I make them for people to use. And that was his idea. So, and this is the one, I mean, this is one that I made. And I compare. You know, I, I grab this thing, and when I make a three-prong, I look at it, and I think, well, this tines need to be a little bigger. But it, he had a reason for small tines, and that was so that he could gig smaller fish with it. And Dad always said... He said it once, uh, he said a good gig maker, if you can make a three prong gig, uh, you have a ride. And uh, I've sat there and watched him make a little bitty three prong crawdad gig. And that was a goal of mine. And then just two years ago, I made, I think I made 15 three prong gigs. There were crawdad gigs, which is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a task. But anyway, this is a piece of metal. And this is what, we're, what I'm doing is uh, I've got through hammering it out. And it's taking this metal, hammering it out, and drawing, drawing it out to a certain length. And you can see, again, that was three inches here after the drawing process. And now it's four inches. And we're trying to flatten it out and getting it into a workable length. And then once we get it to that length, then we take in what we call the spoon phase. And it's just starting at the top and hammering it and flattening it out to a certain width. And then you work, you work it down so that you get the neck of your ferrule here and then what you're going to plan on the size that you want. <coughs> and there's another picture of it. And there, there's again, to verify that it was three inches and now we've expand, I've expanded it to five. I probably could have carried it out to, three, to six inches, but that is, that is a long, I mean, it's a long crawdad gig. All right, and then once we get the ferrule made, then we, we turn it over and we shape the ferrule and then we flatten the neck out of it and we also flatten the end out of it and we get it ready to split. And this is what the chisels come in handy for. So it's heated and we measure the middle of it and we cut, we cut it up to the, about the neck and this is when we're getting ready to make the tines themselves. And there's a... There's, a, there's that one after I split it the first time. So I got it separated. And then when, once it's separated, the little needle nose pliers that you have that are roll along come in handy. But the, a lot of times, once it gets to this stage, we use the shaping spikes. So it's just putting there, tapping it on, and then working it. And then we, a lot of the, the biggest, I mean, there's a, the anvil itself, every part of the anvil is used to help shape the gig. And then there it is, I've widened it out a little more. And once I've widened it out, then I'm getting ready to draw each tine out. And when I draw the tines out, a, uh, a gig that starts out like this will eventually look like this. And this is almost close to finished stage. The only thing that I haven't done here was measure the tines to make sure that they're the same length. And I'll heat it again and I'll hammer it along the edges to draw it out. And once I get them the same length, then the next thing I'll do is I'll heat it again. And then I have a rounding hammer, which is, it looks like a, a ball peen hammer, but it's got a flat head on it. It's kind of what a, uh, a, uh, well, uh, they would use in an auto body repair whenever they flatten out, uh, when they flatten out fenders that are damaged. And then it's just a process of starting and rolling it until you get it. And it'll draw it out. I mean, this right here will draw out probably, you know, this, you know, probably an inch or more. And then, uh, one of the things that I did not show is we have, a, we have another anvil, but this anvil has wedges that are welded on the top of it. And these wedges is what gauges the width of our tines. So we take them and we heat it and then we roll them over. And we have different wedges for different shapes. And this one, is a, this one basically is a special wedge that you use. It's, it's, got, three, it's got two wedges and... Uh, then that helps shape the three-prong gig. Otherwise, if we just use one wedge and fold it over, we're going to get that shape right there. But what you want is you want that, 
you want that middle wedge here and you want it to flare out. And sometimes when we, when, when I say we, my brothers and I, when we get out there, when we roll it over, one of the tines will be longer, so we'll wind up cutting one. And this is, I made this middle tine longer than the rest of them, and there's a special, specific reason for that, is uh, I want it longer, so I want that to be the first part that makes contact with the gig itself. And then you can see the tines. A lot of people, and I've seen gigs that are, they use a, a jet cutter or a torch, and they'll, they'll shape it, and they'll draw the tine out, and they'll cut the barb into it, and then the barb sticks out. Well, the idea behind the barb is that, and Dad always took his and then rolled them over. And that way, when he, when he gigged into roots and it, and it got wedged, if he remembered where his tines were at, he could twist it back and get it unhung and then pull it out. Otherwise, if the wedges were, if the barbs were sticking out, once you got it hung, that's it. You had to break the gig or, you know, pull yourself out of the boat trying to get it loose. I have seen that happen. Okay. Okay, and then this, this picture here is what this, what this gig looks like right here, and it's almost close to the finish stage. Um, years ago, before lanterns, before taking your uh, working light, hooking it up to a battery, there were, uh, they would take these baskets, these wire baskets, and they would put pine cones in them and pour pine tar or some kind of pitch in them and they would light them and that was what they used for their light outside. They would hang it over the side of their boat and that's what they used for the light was just the fire itself. They would uh, ignite the, the pine cones and the pitch would burn and that's what they used for their lighting source because they didn't have access to batteries or light bulbs or, or lanterns now, which is kind of what we use. And, and there's a picture, you can, see, you can see the gigs there. Looks more like, you know, Satan's spear than anything. <laughs> And that's what Dad always called it. He, you know, he makes a gig, but it looks like something Satan would carry around. And there's, there's a picture of my dad, and there's the, there's the four types of gigs that, that he made. And that's the same, you know, I used the same technique in totem hair. And Dad went to totem for that special technique, and that was how to roll, how to roll those tines over. And there's, there's a little bit to that, and that's one of the trade secrets for... Uh, making you know this specific gig how to cut those barbs in how to shape the end of it and when to cut those barbs in and that's a little bit of a trade secret that uh, very few people know a lot of a lot of them and i've seen several will take and draw the tine out and they'll roll it over and then before it fuses together or welds together they'll pull the end up to make the barb and then they'll they'll fit uh, they'll fashion the point so it's all, you know, it's one continuous part, and, I, and I've looked at it, and I thought, well, sometime moisture's going to get inside of that, and it's going to start to rust. And what I do, and, it, you know, this, Dad's had this gig for a long time. It's got a little bit of rust on it, and I made this one uh, before Dad passed away. But uh, you coat it with oil, and we use motor, I use motor oil to help temper, like, especially right now, I've never, I've never made gigs in the wintertime, but this, this is the first time I've ever made a gig in the wintertime. And for something about the cold air and the moisture in the air, it's hard to temper metal unless you have a specific uh, technique. And what I've done is I've taken the can of sand and put a fish fryer underneath it, turned it on, heated the sand up to a certain temperature. I have a temperature gauge that I stick in the sand. Anywhere from about uh, 230 to 240 to 260, I take the gig, stick it in there, and I, let, and I turn the heat off and I let everything cool down and that gives me a good temper. And you can always tell when a gig has a good temper and you can hear it, you can hear it vibrate. Yeah, yeah exactly, that's what, it, that's what it sounds like. And you don't want to get it too tempered, otherwise it will be brittle. And then what causes a brittle gig is that if you, if you get it to the finish stage and you got it heated and all of a sudden you, would, you, you dip it in uh, oil, a lot of people use olive oil or peanut oil or coconut oil, I, I say just use that oil to cook with, don't waste it. But just good old motor oil helps. Uh, but you can get it too brittle and once it expands it will crack. So just, uh, you know, it's just a technique that it's tried and true over, over time. Uh, 
And one of the things that I started making a couple of years ago is uh, tomahawks, or what people call traditionally just they call it a hawk. This is made out of a railroad spike. It's taking the end of uh, the uh, the hammered end of it, flattening it out so that you got a point, and leaving the point. And um, I'll tell you what, when looking at this thing up close, it's about that long, and it's scary as all get out to think <laughs> that who, you know, who who would want to go into a fight where you didn't have any guns or anything, but just use this. This is this is scary. And then there's a picture of, this is dad, and there's, this, there's that blower, and there's the old, what he used for it. And what he used starting out was just a box fan that he poured concrete in. He fashioned the hole inside of it. And like I said, dad was, he was pretty innovative. I mean, he was creative as all get out. And then there's, there's the little uh, outdoor shed that we work at every day. It's not, it's not enclosed. In the summertime, it's hot. You know, I've hammered it out there when the outside temperature was, you know, 97, 98, 101. And when you're standing next to a fire, it makes it 110, 113, and you've got 10 or 15 gigs to make. And, you know, these people want to go crawdad hunting. So, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're pressed for time, and it doesn't matter what conditions you, you hammer in. And there's another picture of him with a sucker. This is a this is what we call August fish because, you know, a lot of times we'd fish through the summer and then at the end of the summer, you know, they'd caught all the bass and stuff out of it. So we would go down there and gig a bunch of suckers. And the process of cleaning a sucker is that you scale him, you fillet him, and you turn him over so that you got the flesh part of it and you score, you score the meat about a quarter inch and you have little bitty lines in there. And what you're doing is you're exposing, there's little bones and it's like a trout, it has lots of bones in it. And when you cook him, those Bones crystallize so it makes it makes them edible. Okay. So they don't have to hold you down and get tweezers or pliers and pull the bone out of your throat. <laughs> yeah. And this there's just a little three clips of what we do in the summertime. Um, any given night my kids will come in and say, Dad, let's go get crawdads. And I, the the pictures, you know, the pictures they are what they are. They don't do justice for the time spent with each other and the amount of time that I spent with my dad on the creek when we weren't playing softball, you know, those nights that we were playing softball, we were down chasing crawdads, or in the wintertime, we were going gigging at night, gigging suckers. But uh, there's a crawdad there in the middle. It's one of the biggest crawdads I've seen in a long time, and we killed probably 12 of them in that one little hole this summer. Dustin, you know, he's my, he's my youngest son. He said, Dad, he said, look at this crawdad, and he, he holds his hand out, and he lays that crawdad on its tail, it's back to his wrist, and his pinkers are past his fingers, and Dustin's got a big hand. But well, that, that's a big crawdad. I told him it was almost a, we call them, that's almost like a lobster. But here we are, we're cleaning crawdads. And again, you know, traditional, we, I use a, a lantern and we have little headlamps. And the easiest time to get crawdads is at night because they come out to feed and it makes them easy to gig. The, uh, it, we did the little clip with the OCO, the Voices of the Turkey People. And that day that we were scheduled to do our shoot, it rained that night. And I kept thinking, boy, you know, you guys know how much rain we got this past summer. And I went down the creek and looked at it, it was fine. But that evening, and I didn't realize that, you know, from, from upstream, that rain was going to hit the creek. And when we got down here, it was dingy. And I thought, oh, God. And my daughter was with me, and she said, Dad, we can get crawdads. And I, I kept thinking, I said, Katie, we can't see. But she said, hey, let's go to the bank. So we went over to the bank, and her and Dustin always go to the bank when we're there. And that's where those big crawdads come from. She, well, they would sit there, and she, she'd take her gig. At the, there's a little hole on the side of the bank. She'd take her gig and just kind of scratch it. And you, every now and then you would see a pincher come out. Pincher would come out and clip onto the gig, and Dustin would gig the crawdad. And we got, we got a bowl full that night mm -hmm. for the clip. And I, I kept thinking, you know, I forgot all about it. But, you know, having those guys with me, they, they, you know, it made it an enjoyable night. We were able to do, do the clip. So... And that's, you know, that's a, really about, about it. You know, a lot of things I, I haven't showed you. This is a single prong, this is a single prong gig. And uh, what we do with single prong gigs is we use cane poles. Uh, we cut the end of a cane pole, we, we fashion a dowel to stick inside of it, and then we carve the dowel down to, uh, to the shape of the ferrule. And uh, growing up, when I first started gigging with my dad, you know, well, I watched him, you know, carry around, I watched him carry around gigs like this, and that's what I wanted. 
I wanted to use a gig like my dad did, but he uh, he would always said, you guys go get those single prongs. And well, I, just, I hated it. But this is what he told me. He said, if you boys learn to hit something with this, you, you, you will never want to use something like this. And a quick story, we had went down the creek, and there was, a, there was a good fish hole up the creek. And Dad was with three or four of his buddies. And one of them went by, and he kind of laughed at me and Dondi, my brother. He said, you guys want to get anything with those? And we just kind of looked at him. They went up the creek, and you know, they, I don't know, they may have gotten about eight or nine suckers. But while we were standing there, these, these little shad, they call them Tennessee shad, were, I mean, they were shooting by. They'd been, uh, they went up there, I don't know, it's probably 30 minutes, and Donnie and I kept gigging shad down here, and then finally we started gigging suckers. I think they had eight suckers. We had, when they come walking down, and they said, did you guys gig anything? And we and Donnie were standing like that. We just, we just turned around and looked. We had 12 suckers behind us and 24 shad behind us. And, a little, and a, all I can remember, Dad was saying, uh, you guys should have went with us. <laughs> and then Donnie said, well, I wish you would have took us. But anyway, we had to use little gigs like this until, you know, and, and then Dad, he made us all a gig. I still, and the three brothers, the four of us, my son and the three, the three boys, we all have a gig that Dad made. So that we've used in the past now. It's not worth over time, the end wear down, you get close to the barb, but uh, we have those saved. So, but the technique and everything is the same. I, I use the technique that Totem Hare taught my dad, that my grandfather's taught him. And that will never pass, and I don't know, probably pass when I pass. But I've taught my son, and he comes out and he hammers with me. And that's kind of what I did with my dad. When I was little, I'd get out there and he'd say, you want to hammer? Boy, and I was eager to, but it was hot and I got burned. You know, some days it was fun, some days it wasn't, it was hot. So, but that's, you know, that's basically gig making. Now, along with it goes, you know, the family times that you spend with each other. You know, again, you know, we have a, you know, there was a lot of families in our community, and Fourth of July was a special time for us. Uh, you know, our family, two or three others, I mean, it looked like a whole tribe would go down the creek, and we'd fish and crawdads and fried taters and brown beans. So, but those, those are the times that I remember. I try to take my kids down there and do those things, but it doesn't, it, nobody seems to be able to do it as often as we were able to. You had, life takes over. But any questions? You fit this to the shaft, what, what you do is, uh, you're actually shaping the wood to the size of the shaft that you have. No. Um, what you do is uh, you go ahead and tap it on. What we'll do is the little places that I was telling you what we use to spread the, tine, the prongs or the tines, we'll put on there, we'll tap it on there, and then we'll take it and we'll dip it in water. Water causes the wood to swell, and when it swells, it kind of adheres to the metal. We have never, never lost a gig by that technique. A lot of people will take them, and they'll, as soon as they buy a big gig off of me, they'll say, uh, Shay, can you drill me a hole? I thought, man, you're going to ruin the gig. And one of them, I, I did, I had a good gig. And I took it over to the drill press, and I started drilling a hole. Well, the first one was successful. Got to the other side, and it cracked. And I said, see? I said, that's why, you know, that's, that's why we don't, we don't do it. A lot of them want to put a, you know, put a pin in it or put a, a screw and a bolt in it, and that holds the gig on it. But you don't, you don't have to. You just, if you'll shape the wood, you know, enough to get a tight fit and then wet it because wood expands and then it will adhere to the metal inside of it. So. Does this class come with recipes? Does this class come with recipes? <laughs> hey, I'm going to tell you what, that, that OCO crew that was with us, well, we did two, we did two, we did one with the crawdads and later in the fall, the same crew came out and did uh, one with mushrooms and both times they wanted to stay. And you know, I don't invite anybody. And uh, and again, I you know, I invite any of you guys through the summertime if you want to go get crawdads one night. Uh, I have a Cherokee Nation email, Larry hyphen shade at Cherokee dot org. Send me an email and we'll go. Um, you know, I make gigs for you know, for us to use. I also make gigs and you know as a profit. So, but uh, the metal we use is from Old Buggy Springs. Uh, old car leaf springs, uh, 
the uh, this three prong gig that I have here, and I can pass these around if you guys want. The the three prong gig that I have here is uh, is made from a old old lawnmower blade, the old thick ones. Dad had I don't know he knew somebody, then he got a whole stack of them. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Anybody have questions? Yes. It is legal to gig rough fish during a certain time of the year. Uh, the creek is right behind my house. So the, the landowner allows us to go on the creek and we gig uh, you know, suckers and carp, <laughs> drum, things like that. It is illegal to gig bass, crappie, uh, catfish, so only rough fish. So basically it's illegal to, to gig game fish. It's illegal to gig game fish, yes. <laughs> I got asked a question this summer too, right before our, right before our uh, little OCO clip, and then I got curious, and, I, and believe me, if, and I, I tried every game warden on this side of the state, every phone number that was listed, nobody answered, and finally I knew Brady May that lives up Highway 10. I said, Brady, I have a question. He said, Shay, what are you, what are you asking for? What are you wanting to do? Is what he said. And I said, No, I don't want to do anything. Uh, I said, How many crawdads in possession? Because I, you know, I've heard stories. You're only going to be allowed so many, or 15, or whatever. He said, "Shade, you can go down and get as many crawdads as you want." I said, "Thank you." <laughs> so, um, but he said, "He said, who knows? Later on in the future, it may be regulated." He said, "Because a lot of people are coming into our creeks and streams and uh, getting crawdads for commercial use, and it's fishing." Yeah. So, what do you charge? For what I charge. I, for a gig like this, it's sixty-five dollars for a crawdad gig. Uh, and this is about a little over, about a six and a half foot pole is forty dollars. So, I don't think my son would want me to sell it, but I, I have, I have zero. This is the only thing I have to sell, and then the gig head that's being passed around the crawdad gig, the three prong gig. Uh, I took it off my pole. My pole was so long I couldn't carry it in my truck. So I, I do have. I have, and I have everything that I have. I have used it. I have a, uh, I have a 12 foot, almost a little over three quarter inch diameter river gig, and uh, I've used it. But it's for sale, and it's got, and uh, it's made out of a horseshoe rasp. I cut the horseshoe rasp in half, and then made a real long two prong gig. A buddy of mine wanted it, and then uh, all of a sudden he never came and got it. So it's for sale. But any questions? Mm -hmm. is that primarily where you sell? Most of the time, that, that's the only place that I sell there, and uh, that, and by word of mouth. Uh, but every, you know, every turkey holiday, we'll set up at the Heritage Center, and usually we're there. Mom has some turkey books and some of Dad's books that uh, that has the turkey sayings and legends. But I have a lot of, and I don't make a whole lot of product. I'll have probably about 20 gigs and probably about 15 fish gigs, and I'll have a few hatchets along with that. Any questions? Somebody had a question over here. Yes. What, what kind of wood? Do you okay, use? the wood that we use. There's three primary types of woods that we use: uh, walnut, black locust, and then uh, bodark or Osage orange or uh, horse apple. Now I don't make this is I mean, this is a, this is a walnut. I don't make a bodark gig pole. You know, I'll make one about that big, but that's as big as I'll make it because it's real dense. It's real heavy. There's no sense in making. A bold arc pole into something big because it, it's so heavy that uh, it don't when you when you use it to gig it's only going to add extra force and I'd rather have a I'd rather gig with a light gig than than a heavy gig because I mean and it is a process I I fashion gig poles two ways traditional was you just take take a knife and start splitting it and then start whittling away at it and I also use power tools which you know Sears is pretty good. <laughs> Question? How do I take the temper out of the rest? Just heat it and then get it into a workable stage. And while you're working, uh, it won't be tempered. But then you can add the temper back, and you can also you can add half of the temper back to it. Because I know a rasp will crack, and uh, I haven't had one come back cracked yet. But uh, and it makes a beautiful gig because it looks like scales on it. I mean, you'll have scales all the way up the ferrule and down the tines. It's, I mean, it's beautiful. Dad made one once, and I looked at it, and I really wanted it. 
And I told him, I said, Dad, I want that gig. And he said, he just nodded his head. Two or three weeks later, there was some gentleman come by, and there that gig went down the road. <laughs> so and he, he did the, his next comment was, I taught you how. <coughs> so, and, and just like the comment in that, in, in, you know, what he said to his grandpa, he said, if I, if I always make gigs for you, then that's what I'll always do. So he, I mean, he would, went back to that saying, I, he, and it basically was, I want you to learn how. So... Any questions? I mean, I'm, I'm going to answer any question you have. You have about three minutes. So your son, he's capable. Yes, my, my son, I have two boys, and both of them are capable of, of making, and he made this from start to finish. That's his, that's his woodwork, and that is, that is, uh, that's his gig also. Because when I went out of the house this morning, he said, what are you going to do with my crawdad gig? You're not going to sell it, are you? And I said, no, I'm just going to use it for show. Yes. Could you say your email address again, please? Larry Dashade at Cherokee.org. I also have another email address. It is Lost City Shade at gmail.com. And you might be able to remember that one. Just I live in the Lost City community. Okay. Okay. Lost my wife. Yes. <laughs> Could you just give us a little demonstration, just the stance or whatever? And that, and that is a good question because my dad, whenever he would gig, he would hold a gig like this. And with the, when the gig's wet and your hands are wet, it's easy to grip the wood. And this is how he would gig. Now, my brothers and I, we would grab the end of the gig like so. And uh, it's just what you're comfortable with, and, you know, what, you, what you've basically taught yourself how to. No, this is what we do. We take a knife and we'll, we'll wring it out. And then we'll just cut a little groove around it, and we'll tie a cord or something around the end of it. And that cord will be probably twice the length of the gig. My brother, you know, he always made his string three times the length of the gig because he, he liked to throw it long ways. But there's no sense in making, and I always told him, there's no sense in making a long gig if there's anything you're going to gig is just, you know, close. And, uh, but that's basically the technique of it. Mm -hmm. And then in a boat, you can you, we use it for a push rod, but you know you're standing there in the boat and you've got a, about a 12 foot, 14 foot gig, and then basically you're just you're just right above the fish, and, and I'm, I hope I didn't put a hole in the carpet. <laughs> yes. Earlier you were talking about the re retraction of the light. Yeah, my my dad, yeah, he mentioned that the water itself has an image refraction where you see an object go in. If you ever held your arm in there or a stick or something, it the you know, the image go down and it looks like it's broken. So what we would do was we learned to aim below the fish because, because of pressure, volume, and just a science thing, the, the gig would hit the water and it would basically push it up. So basically you wanted to aim below the fish and that would allow the gig to, to travel onto the object or the fish itself. So. How much are your hatchets? Hatchets run anywhere from $80 to $120. Uh, I put leather and beads and things like that on them, but just a, just a regular hatchet like the one in the picture is about $80. And I temper the ends of them so if you're camping and it's all you have then you're able to chop wood with it or cut limbs or something like that. Is that, is that it? I think so. Okay. Um, but like some parting, to give some parting words. Well, guys, I thank you for coming. I've seen a lot of you guys out in the community. My dad has played softball with Dickie and the Sellers gang over here. And, you know, I've seen you guys in passing and meet you all there. You know, I feel fortunate that I got to share my parents. Basically, I look at it this way. I got to share my parents and my dad with you guys. Because you know I, that's you know that was real special to us, you know, and I you know I have the you know we have the videos and things and the memories, and uh, you know I hold those to my heart, you know, Woody, he was around him a lot, you know, and I envy you guys that spent a lot of time with him because you learned a lot. The uh, you know thing that I'm gonna say off the record is that you know he taught us a lot about the the history and the culture, the part of it. I live the tradition. Uh, and I was like him, I live the two worlds. I live, you know, in the world that I function, that I live in, that I provide for my family. But I also carry on the traditions 
of the Cherokee and of the tribes of the things that we that are spiritual to us. I've seen things that, you know, if I was to tell any white person, they would say, no. I'd have to say, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, really, I, I have. And, you know, it's some of the things that, you know, Dad would say, as you get older, I can, I'll show you these things. You know, we got certain ages. He took us to different places and, and you know, didn't introduce us to different things. He told us a lot about what we were, what we were going to see. And, you know, his favorite, his favorite saying was, you know, it'll, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. You know, and I, and I, I miss that. So, but we, I still, you know, we, the, the medicines that we use, you know, it was dear to our heart. Uh, you know, my kids very seldom have to go to the doctor for, you know, runny nose or cough or anything. Medicines for kidneys and liver and things like that. Uh, you know, I know how to make these medicines. That's something that he taught us. So we'd drive down the road and he'd say, you see that plant right there? And we'd have to stop and back up. He said, you know, that, that's good for the heart or that's, you know, that's good for the kidneys or, you know. Or put that on there, or you've got a, a sore, just take that leaf or a certain snake skin, piece of it, wet it, and put it on there, and it'll draw out the infection and things like that. You know, that's something that he taught us that, you know, you know, I, you know some of these things will, some of these things I can teach, and some of these things with my family, that it, it will die off with us. And there's turkey sayings that goes up with getting up in the morning and introducing yourself to the world and saying, uh, along with the uh, you know, just asking for protection and guidance, and that the people that you meet will be, you know, people like you, that they'll be your friends one day, but you have to first be their friend first. And that, you know, I, I, you know, he met a lot of people, and you know, he taught us a lot of things. But one of the things that he taught us was how to treat people. And you know, I I enjoyed that going around, and you know, we where we whether we were, wherever we were, Wagner County or uh, Jay or some a couple places in Washington D.C. and Arkansas, we'd walk through there, and somebody would say, "Are you Hastings Shade?" You know, we'd stand here like, you know, where have you been? You know, where have you been? You know, Canada and uh, Alaska, and you know, to this very day, there's a gentleman that that uh, I, I don't know how he does it. But uh, you know he gives us eagle feathers, and it's because of because of my dad. So, but you know that's what he did, and that's what I carry on. He asked me to do this, and I honor him by by doing that. So, I. I well. One of the things, the other thing he said was, when we went gigging, we never took any more than what we needed. He said he called the creek refrigerator. He said, because it's always there. You know, just take what you need, leave the rest for others, and make sure you leave a seed for next year. So. But no, Larry, this was, I learned so much. I, I know this is much harder than I thought it was. I, I knew it had to be hard work, but I saw more detailed here than... Uh, I've ever seen before on gig making and uh, uh, learned a lot and uh, I also I feel like I got to see Hastings a little bit through <laughs> you tonight too well, that we got I'm a little glad. visit from him and so that's very special so um, uh, when you offer to take people fish gigging and crawdad gigging mm -hmm. that's very much Hastings shade yeah I did the little the little, little story um, with the turkey phoenix and in the summer, I've got people coming from Kansas and Arkansas <laughs> that want to come, want to bring their kids, and I, I you know, can't tell them no. Yeah. Just bring them down, and uh, we'll spend the evening together, and might even cook for them. But yeah. that's, you know, it's just a big part of, of what he did. You know, if you were, you know, we'd go gigging at night, and he'd take his skillet and uh, onion and potatoes and bread, and we'd go down there and he'd cook fish, and I've ate everything from carp to gar the you, know, you name it we've tried <laughs> buffalo just i'll tell you gar uh gar is really good when it's hot after it cools off it gets stringy and tough but i'm gonna tell you it, it is really good this the suckers that you saw in the clip there uh, are excellent and what we would do is we would we give them in the summertime take them home and he'd put them in a grinder and he'd grind them up and make fish patties which is really good um, and then you, uh, 
you can get sand bass. Sand bass is about as close to a game fish that you can, but boy, they're fast. Mm -hmm. So if you can gig a, you can gig a mess of sand bass, you're, you're a good gigger. Yeah, and the way you fix those fish, what, the way you score them and don't have to worry about the bones, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah, and these are, and the, the people from Uchi, they, they know the technique. They and do. these are the things that have been passed down, you know, from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And you know, Larry, I mean, Larry sets up at Cherokee Holiday every year. And if you ever want a, a handmade item, a Cherokee item made by a Cherokee that is rare, uh, this is something to get. You know, this is some, I've gotten these for my dad for Christmas. Um, I mean, these are just so hard to come by now, and they're beautifully made. And, uh, um, and I've also learned one thing tonight is if you know something that, uh, um, is of importance to our people, to your family, to your community, pass it down. Even if you think people aren't listening, pass it down anyway. Uh, you know, we're down to uh, one gig maker here, and uh, we, we've got to share our knowledge. And so pass down what you know, n no matter how, uh, even if you think it's something small, you know, something about in your family, something you did, a way of doing things, something you made, the way you believe, the way you do things, pass those things down. Yeah. He, and, would, yeah. Yeah. he would say that, you know, I'm not, he, would, he wouldn't directly say, I'm going to teach, I'm going to, I want you to learn this. Mm -hmm. he, he would, when we were with him, he would always say, come over here, uh, mm -hmm. this is a teaching. Yeah. That was his famous quote, this is a teaching. He would never say, you need to learn this or uh, watch and see how to do it. He would just say, what, this is a teaching. You need to learn this and then you know, so, you know, so much of, of the little comments that he made, and I was telling her earlier, you know, I miss that about him because he was, you know, you hear politicians all the time that hear, you know, they hear, you hear the same story over and over. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we were in Jay that time when he was, he was campaigning and he was running. The gentleman asked him, said, Hasten, how is campaigning going? <laughs> and Dad just kind of smiled and looked around at everybody. And he said, well, it's, it's going pretty good, but I'll, I'll tell you this. He said, uh, if I stopped and threw a rock at every dog that barked at me, I'll never get where I'm going. <laughs> so it was just little things like that, that that he'd say, and it was. Well, thank you for being here, Larry. I have just a little gift. It's the new Cherokee, uh, Cherokee oh. New Testament that uh, was just published, and just want to give you that as a gift for coming out and sharing an evening with us. We really oh, appreciate, appreciate, it. appreciate it. all you do to keep this going, and thank you all again for coming, Wado. Yeah, and Wado to you. Yeah. Yeah.